welcome back. Hump day. Hello, everybody. Oh, hump day. <laughs> where, 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 where's my hump? Where's day. my hump? Where's my hump? I don't know. <laughs> welcome, everybody, <laughs> to Chaps Many Cultures. This is hump day, as some people call it. Um, I call it a regular work day. I don't know what this humping is all about. I don't know. Neither do I. Neither do I. All right. All right. All right. All right. Especially in especially in this uh, this day and age, where you know it's uh, just another day, another day, another dollar, another wonderful global day for all the beautiful people around the world, and uh, we're coming to you live. Um, well, assuming you're watching us live here at Two Chaps Mini Cultures. How are you today, pal? I am excellent because I already got a lot of work under my belt today, and I have a lot more work coming up. Later today, I am booked solid this week, which is awesome. In yeah. COVID times, that's not always the case. So I am just grateful yeah. for being being in demand. That's a good thing to be. And there's also we have a guest. We have a guest with us today who's, I think he's also quite in demand. You, not every one of you may know this yet, but this is a man that I've been. Um, Let's say I don't want to say chase, but um, we, we, John and I we've been circling each other for let's say months, and it was largely due to my inability to nail down a time and date. Um, but I'm happy that he's on here today, and we got some more stuff, collaborative stuff going on. We're excited to tell you about so that that I hope will also be in high demand with you out there live or watching the recording. And stereotypes aside, may yes. we say, well, it's not, it's morning. Well, it's not morning. It's not morning for me either. But anyway, I love to say this. Top of the morning, John. <laughs> top, <laughs> top, top of the morning. As long as you don't say St. Patty's Day, it's St. Patrick's Day. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> only only men get to say that, and they, they hopefully get a, a, a strong Irish fist into their face for saying <laughs> Well, good, good to see you guys. Thanks for the invite, uh, Brad and Christian. How are you guys doing? Ooh. Finer than fun. Good. Good, 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 good. Where are you dialing in from? Where are you joining us from? I am joining in for Limerick. So Limerick. Um, Limerick, you might have heard of the concept of a Limerick, for example. So we might as well start the way well, start the, the recording. A Limerick. So ex exactly, exactly. So I'm going to have a little bit of French here for uh, for this one for good measure. So there was an, an old man called Pas Sweeney. In Nice, he drank a quart of martini. The local gendarme rang his wife in alarm. Nous regrettons Pas Sweeney et fini. That's, uh, that's your Limerick for today. The world. I don't know if more than that, I'm afraid. <laughs> we need, but, we uh, need to. It's typed out in the comments so people can actually recollect what that means. So, <laughs> actually, let's let's do this. Let's invite people. If you're watching, if you're watching this live, you're watching a replay, and you know a good limerick, put it in the comments. Dude, we, would, oh, yeah, we would love limerick. Limericks are fun. Yes. <laughs> so, so educate us. Um, a limerick is a place in Ireland on in the on the yep. island of Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland, we want to make that distinction clear. And it, how come that the, the town or the place called Limerick is synonymous with a certain um, poem? Or a uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. This has been around for, oh God, I, I'd say uh, certainly over 100 years anyway. It's a, a long, long tradition or it must have been a poet that came up with it at the time, this particular structure, and it became popularized and just grew more popular over the years. I don't have an exact name of who came up with it, but, uh, yeah, it's just been something that's been around ever since then. And it's the one thing that when you say you're from Limerick, people around the world go, oh, I know a Limerick. And especially <laughs> especially in the in the U.S., people tend to have probably maybe one up their sleeve, let's say, for especially those with an Irish, uh, let's say, Irish-American heritage. Which is is a, a which are colors that are proudly worn here in the United States, uh, whether you are Irish or not. There, uh, especially on a certain day in March, people discover their Irishness and then find that to be a great excuse to um, drink excess amount of um, adult yeah. beverages. So I think is it they, uh, paint, they paint the uh, the river in Chicago usually uh, green, for example, if I'm not mistaken, and there's like green everywhere, and I think it's big St. Yeah. Patrick's Day parades as well in like New York and Chicago. Yeah. And, and yeah, Boston too. And, Boston, and, yeah, yeah. 
Here's my Irish story, and I keep telling this to everybody who doesn't want to know it. Um, there, since I'm not American, I was born and raised in in Germany, and I'm I'm actually from a certain part of Germany, the state of Bavaria, which let's say, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, without Irish influence, we would still be heathens. So it was, <laughs> it, 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 was not, it was not the Romans who brought Christianity across the Alps to Christianize these wild Germanic people. In fact, it was Irish traveling monks in the 6th century that came from Ireland to, to, make, to make us Bavarians into, into good God-fearing Catholics. Um, Fun fact, and, I didn't actually know that, yeah. Oh yeah, and and many 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 of the old monasteries in 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 southern Germany um, can be traced back to to foundations that were laid by Irish traveling monks. We still yeah. have in, in in the Bavarian countryside in in rural areas, uh, people still give their kids names that are somewhat in an Irish tradition. The one name that always comes up is Corbinian. Which is basically the Germanized version of Corbin, um, the, the very Irish name, and the, that, that Bavarian Irish connection has been there for for centuries, right? And you go to well, maybe not this year, but in years where we don't have to wear masks and distance ourselves, you go to the Oktoberfest in Munich, mm -hmm. and you'll be—I'll bet you a hundred, a hundred moss, a hundred liters of beer—I'll bet you that <laughs> you will encounter a bouncer or some kind of door security person at one of the Oktoberfest beer halls who is in fact Irish, who's there for the job. That's a good one. Well, I'll tell you another fun fact of the day. I have a big connection in my family with Bavaria because I, I basically, I spent a summer uh, working in Passau, uh, sorry, I spent a summer working in Munich. Um, I wanted to try and get to understand German culture. So I spent the summer working in a Hard Rock Cafe uh, opposite the Hope, <laughs> opposite the Hope Play House. But I then spent a, a year studying in Passau. But I actually have um, a brother of mine who's living in Munich now and he got married to uh, a young German lady last, uh, last year. So uh, nice. yeah, we have a strong connection. Yeah, nice, lovely, and we just found out, and before we went live, that John and I we've known each other for a while, um, but I didn't know, and I guess he didn't know either. We have the same alma mater. We went to the same university. We both went to University of Passa. So lovely, lovely to hear that here. This is a mm -hmm. some 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 kind of global connection here. Awesome. No, hundred percent. I think Irish people are very good at that finding the connection, the relationship as well. I think it's funny. I mean, uh, you give even a last name to somebody in Ireland, they'd say, "Oh, well, you're the McNamara from Leash. You know, another McNamara." Yeah, because it's such a small country, it's quite easy to find the connection in some way. It could be a sports club, it could be a last name, it could be someone from work. Let's say. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we made an announcement for this live session today, and we said you, you're a special kind of global if you are the parent of a daughter who has been to 23 countries before she had turned two. So I took that from your bio. I don't actually know that story. So I'm I'm curious how how did you become a nomad with a little kid in tow? Yeah, it's a good one. So basically, when we were, first of all, myself and, and my wife, T, we were always like huge nomads. We just live for traveling, exploring the world and meeting people from different cultures. And, you know, my own work, I did a huge amount of travel anyway uh, in my, let's say, previous corporate uh, corporate role. And I, I just loved it. I love working and dealing with different cultures. And so when T came up with the idea of coaching me a couple of years ago, it became really critical. You know, you've got to go and, and really spend time in these countries and get to know the people. You know, there's only so much like, talking to people from different Coaches you can do if you haven't actually really been there and so it basically made it our business to really go and travel as much as possible all around Europe for example and then spend six months for example living in Asia mm -hmm. and that's kind of how it came about so we kind of had a base in Amsterdam where we're already living and the great thing about Amsterdam it's so brilliantly interconnected you can just hop in a car and, and drive around let's say uh, and then uh, as well then over in Asia we based ourselves in Thailand put uh, Rosen into a crash there uh, but it was fantastic so I, I basically a little tip that we used is I just had Rosa for a lot of the, the trips where you'd be doing three or four countries in the space of like say three weeks let's say I uh, had uh, a little kind of an ergo baby where I would have Rosa attached onto the front of me and she'd go to sleep in my chest and I would be filming all the different videos of D for, ex for example uh, with Rosa attached onto my chest but it was very easy for traveling for flying and all the rest but she got so much out of it actually she had uh, mm -hmm. by the end of it by the end of her six months for example in Thailand Rosa was uh, I mean she was like maybe 17 months old and she was able to do like the Sawadi Sawadi Ka little bow the Thai greeting for example and she got so much out of it and uh, she's turned out great uh, since then it was something that a really wonderful memory for us to have uh, as a young kind of young family with Rosa growing up. 
How old is she now? She's three now. She's three, three, three now. now. Yeah. yeah. We have a uh, we have a ten year old who um, probably not twenty odd countries, but she's been to twelve or fourteen or so, mm. and uh, and speaks two languages and with, with my Polish wife. But I, with when we're working with parents that are off mm. going off to assignments with children, they, you know, they they often. Uh, asking me how I travel with, how you traveled, what's your experience traveling with young children? I think it's been fantastic. I mean, certainly there are moments, but yeah. I encourage people to travel with children. I mean, they really do adapt. They, they, they conform and they get used to the, the discombobulation and the ambiguity uh, that, that comes with it. And, and I think, but the challenge is I tell people, be careful of the child you're about to build because. Yeah. Now with our daughter who's 10, when the word vacation or holiday comes up in our, in our um, family, the, her first thought is, which country do, are we going to? Mm. <laughs> not, not are we going to the next state? Are we going, you know, what beach are we going yeah, to? Yeah, that's fascinating. I, mean, I know it's such, a, it's such a, a big kind of a dilemma for Dean myself because, you know, I mean, for us, we feel we're so proud to be from Ireland. It's such a, an incredibly important part of our identity. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we also see how traveling around the world has been so enriching for us and for our mindset and for our experiences. So kind of for us, if we look to our kids for the next kind of 20 years, it's kind of trying to find that balance. But on the one hand, giving them an anchor, uh, an anchor of uh, hopefully Irish culture where they're going to be able to spend, let's say, the next 20 years, I, you know, maybe a good 10 years of that um, in, in Ireland, if not, if not more or less, who knows. Uh, but on the other hand, that there'll be moments where we'll be able to spend a couple of years traveling abroad and really getting under the skin of different cultures. Like, for example, I would love to spend more time in Asia again. I would love to, you know, I would love to try and give the Middle East a go for a year, for a year or two. I'd love to go and spend some time, for example, in, in Africa and maybe even in the U.S. for you. Who knows? I mean, for, for me, I think there's a there's a deep hunger. Once you get the bug for this, you just can't let it go, I guess. That's such a huge part of your identity. But you're so right. I think, Brett, being careful of the child you're about to build you've got to be very <laughs> intentional about it it's not right it's a it's very difficult yeah. balancing yeah I, I, I think and and I, it was always my intention to have um emily grounded in the polish culture and uh the u.s culture she's from here she was born here you know if she wants to make daddy happy she'll say she's she's an aussie she'll eat her fair share of sausage rolls and vegemite um <laughs> But it is so. It's great. Yeah, I think I think it's wonderful. I'm all, I'm biased, of course. I say that to my clients. I'm biased. I'm I really want you to build these children. I want you to build the understanding and the awareness. Of well, you know, I, 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 I'll yeah. never I'll never forget like when when we were in Thailand, we were living in place in Phuket and on this place called the Soy, the Soy that had um, uh, a fantastic fitness street. It was brilliant gyms, a great work co working space. But there was also a great crash nearby. And one of the things that blew me away when we went to Thailand is that I thought, I thought Europe people were really good at looking after kids. But my God, once you went, when you went over to Asia, particularly, for example, in Thailand, they were brilliant with kids. They're just another level of the respect and how careful and how fantastic they are, kids. And I'll never forget, we had, let's say, Rosa, I would take her in a little uh, a little moped going to the crash nearby every day. And I'll never forget the, the second last day that we collected her from the crash. Uh, we, I, I just had, we were saying goodbye to the lady who'd been looking after her for those six months. And I, I literally started crying because I couldn't get over how somebody who'd been so good to Rosa, a total stranger, total stranger, had been so good and taught me an awful lot about wow, you know, and a culture how how fantastic are looking after, uh, looking after young uh, young kids, and being so grateful for it left a big imprint on me. I have to say, that's one of the things I would say for living in Asia is the respect for older people and for for kids. They're just uh, just really blew me away. Mm. That's a lovely that's a lovely story. Um, I'm curious, <clears throat> the the travel bug is that. And I don't, of course, this is a sweet generalization. Now, mm. knowing about a little bit about Irish history, especially Irish history in the last 200, 250 years, mm. um, a lot of people left Ireland because of unfortunate situations at home. So there's probably more people of Irish descent living outside of Ireland than, than are living in the Republic today. Yeah. Is, is, is it that 
um, because the Irish became such a, I don't want to call it a diaspora uh, culture, but the, a, a culture that was okay with leaving the island mm -hmm. for, for a better shores or more promising future. Is, is mm -hmm. that something that is ingrained in Irish mentality that let, let, let's go out and explore? Or is it is, is that more of a personality trait? And there's a bunch of Irish who said, hey, leave me alone with the world. I'm happy the way I'm in, I am here at home. Great, great, great question. One of the things that's been fascinating is there's been big waves of emigration from Ireland over the last 200 or so years. So if you go back to the 1840s, 1850s, you had the Great Famine. There was a big right. potato famine where basically in the space of like 10 years, um, Irish people who were vast majority, like there was none of them really landowners. For, for the most part, they were uh, a lot of the Irish population, the Catholics in particular, were the ones who really didn't have access to, for example, a lot of basic foods, but potatoes were a huge part of their diet. Um, and so what happened was, is with the potato famine, there was a potato blight and you just couldn't have potatoes anymore. And literally, I mean, Ireland at the, at the time had a population of maybe, I couldn't tell you for sure, but maybe 8 million, 7 or 8 million. And, and literally it, it less than halved overnight practically. You had a bunch of people died, but also people had to emigrate. So it was a huge wave of immigration that people were going over to, for example, Australia, uh, uh, the US, for example, and Canada and the UK, many, part, many other places as well. So that was the first kind of big wave you had of Irish people going abroad globally. So that was very much forced on, on the country at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what you had is in subsequent waves, for example, would have been a, a big one as well, would have been more recently in the 1980s. So the economy was really crashing. There was a lot of uh, structural difficulties with the with the economy. Uh, it yeah, had been the very troubles, right? Exactly, exactly. And so uh, you had the troubles, but you also had an inwardly looking economy where people uh, there had been such a fierce let's say national pride ever since the country became a republic in the 1920s that there was very much a reluctance to even try to export your goods internationally to try and do everything ourselves and as a result right. it led to structural problems with the economy that they, they slowly but surely sorted out but basically in the 1980s we have a lot of members and a wider family and, and friends and whatnot that had to emigrate in the 1980s that created a great lives themselves in the u.s and beyond uh, but then after that then the next one that you had would have been in around the crash in 2007 that's where a lot of let's say people have my generation ended up having to emigrate uh, by choice or otherwise uh, abroad as well. So there have been these these waves, big waves of immigration, which in many ways have created this diaspora, like you said, Christian, all around the world. But it's created these connections in many other parts of the world. For example, an Irish person thinking of going abroad to, to for example, Boston, you know, you might as well, you know, you're, you're going to have like a little bit of Ireland over there. There's going to be so many Irish people in the community and whatnot, whether it's first or second level ancestry or whatnot. And so it feels like a bit of a home from home, these different parts of the world that are like that. So it makes it more accessible, I think. But I think on the other hand, I think because we're an island, because we're a small island, it also, you know, you have people who do have a bit of adventure in their DNA that for them, particularly when you look at the deed let's say you look at the, de the uh, deregulation of the airline industry, it, it makes an island nation much more accessible to the rest of the world for people coming in, mm -hmm. which means Ireland becoming more multicultural, but also people going out. So I think the fact that people can travel so easy around the world has made a big difference. And uh, I think because it's a smaller sized country, it has kind of fed into that hunger for adventure and, and seeing a bit more of the world. It certainly did for me anyway. You, you mentioned, uh, since there is such a great global Irish uh, presence, that mm -hmm. an, an Irish person leaving the Republic to go abroad, they will always find a piece of home abroad somewhere. Uh, th there's a stereotype, and I want you to, to be transparent with us if that's true or not, Perfect. because yeah. mo most Germans, when they go abroad, well... I don't know, let me correct that most Germans, but many Germans that I know, when they go abroad, they will stay the hell away from anything that reeks of <laughs> Germany, right? So with, I, I, will, I will, I stopped going to German restaurants in North America because usually mm. it's a disappointment. Um, mm. However, there's a stereotype that when the Irish leave Ireland and they go to Boston or to Sydney or wherever, uh, first thing they'll find is the local Irish pub. Is, is that true or is that, uh, am I being too... It, well, it, it, it is. I think, but, I suppose if you go back into Irish culture again, if you look at the pub, the pub is is not just like a watering hole to have a few beers. It's a kind of a, it's a, it's a social... It's a social place, uh, you know, beyond just having a drink. It's where people connect, right. relationships get made, people catch up, uh, much more so than than in many other cultures uh, around the world. And so uh, you know, when they're abroad, you have a lot of Irish people are, are uh, let's say, 
can be home birds to a degree. They're very strong connection with home. And when they're abroad, they, they often want to find that connection. And that is one of the best places to find it. And it also helps the fact there's Irish pubs literally in every single city and town practically in the world. And so what I did, for example, when I went to the Netherlands, I a lot of a lot of Irish people uh, in the company I work with had challenges trying to settle into the Netherlands. I made sure I went to a town like Delft where there was like no Irish pubs hardly at all, where there was no Irish community hardly at all. And I would get a chance to really learn the language, speak Dutch and whatnot. But a lot of Irish people don't do that. A lot of Irish people have struggles integrating a little bit into other cultures because they just go easy into the kind of the expat mode, the expat communities, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Irish pub and whatnot. And that becomes then a barrier to, to integration. So it's a bit of a kind of a chicken and egg. You want to try and connect with home which is good. On the other hand, you need to try and give yourself a chance to integrate into the local culture as well. So it's a, right. it's a tricky balancing act. So you speak Dutch, apparently, then? Yep, I do. Explain flu Netherlands. So, so I, was, I was eight years there, so I, I made a big effort. Um, fascinating right. one with the Dutch is that the Dutch speak all, all of them speak pretty much fluent English. But what's mm -hmm. very interesting is when they're speaking with each other, even in meetings, or if they're going to, let's say, the water cooler or the coffee machine, they always speak Dutch. And mm -hmm. so... I had seen this before, and, and they're perfectly entitled to it, but I also could see that how a lot of important conversations were taking place there. And, and so for me, I, I just knew if I wanted, I, I could see myself spending a good number of years in the learning, so I made a big effort to learn it. And look, I'll be, I'll be honest, it did help that I spoke German. Now, saying that, I, I could read and understand a fair bit of Dutch already from the word go, but speaking, right. understanding spoken Dutch is impossible. You need to actually really get your right. head into you're spending proper amount of time there. And so uh, I made sure, for example, that's where I went to Delft. There's, you go to the local market in Delft and people speak Dutch to you if you speak Dutch to them. Uh, whereas in Amsterdam, they speak English to you, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And also I joined a, a local rugby team. I wasn't so bad at rugby. I wasn't exactly a professional, don't get me wrong. But I joined the local rugby team and uh, they were all Dutch. It wasn't an expat rugby team, for example, which I could have joined. And so those kind of things definitely helped me to, to kind of understand the language. And it, I think it really helped. It really, for me, it really helped uh, during my time there. So Dutch, German, French, and French, uh, obviously English, and also speak some Spanish and Irish. But this is going to sound absolutely crazy, but like Irish is the language I've learned the most in school, um, and it's the language I speak the worst. And I'm so ashamed of that. But a lot of Irish people will say the same. Uh, the way it was taught, certainly when I was younger, they've got a lot better at it, by the way. But the way mm -hmm. it was taught, it was very. Uh, it was very much about the grammar, about the structure, and it was less about practicing it and having fun with it and being interactive right. with it. And so, yeah, you have a lot of, I mean, I, I speak so much, don't get me wrong. And it's a very handy language if you're going abroad and you don't want somebody to understand <laughs> you. <laughs> but but at the same time, it's definitely one that when I'm later on in life, I do want to go back and, and get fluent in, in Irish again. So, it's, I mean, it's, again, it's an important part of the national identity, yeah? This might beg some explanation because I think Brett and I, we're we aware of this, but not everybody who's watching this may be consciously aware of that. What, what are you talking about? Irish, don't you guys speak English? So Irish is a, what is it, a Celtic or Gaelic language? Yeah, it's a Gaelic, uh, it's a Ga a Gaelic language. So it's uh, the translation of Irish in, 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 uh, into um, uh, Irish is Gaelga. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, that's the, the, uh, uh, the, the origin of it. And as I said, they teach it literally for from the age of five up until, you know, 80, for example. So you spend whatever, a good 13 years learning the language. But I'm, I'm not joking. Most people really struggle with it. I mean, I, I include, for example, some summers where I went to an Irish school for the summer where you have nothing but speaking Irish. Uh, and even then, it's by far my worst language, by far, by a country mile. And, you know? and they have to teach that in schools because the original Irish language, the, the, the native language that was spoken by the original people that lived there first because of the English occupation, right? So it was English aggression and colonization that suppressed the Gaelic language. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, that's exactly it. I'm also seeing from Tamara makes, is making a good point that they have a Gaelic language in Scotland as well. So there is that connection as well. It's a good thanks, Tamara. Good point. Um, but you're absolutely right. If you uh, if you look at it, you know when let's say uh, when the English came in and and uh, and colonized Ireland uh, over 800 years ago, uh, they made a big effort to suppress the uh, the local language. And mm -hmm. you know, on the one hand, it's a gift because Irish people can now speak fluent English. It's a it's a big asset in today's globalized world. But on the other hand, it's a big challenge because you know your nature, your by nature, your your language is a hugely important part of your culture. If you lose right. your language, you know you lose a little bit of yourself. And so, if you look at it today, there's probably maybe 
maybe only 100, 150,000 people out of the 4 million population of Ireland that speak uh, mm -hmm. Irish regularly. But I think it's critical for us in the future to try and keep that language going. So I think mm -hmm. it is that's one of the reasons why it's kept on as a subject, that at least everyone tries to learn it, to understand a part of their culture. Um, and it means, to be fair, it does mean that Irish people can't take on another foreign language. They might be able to take on one foreign language or if they're lucky. But it does mean a lot of, the, let's say, the courses and the teaching is spent learning Irish. But I think it's still important they do that because it's such an important part of our identity. How closely related is the the original Irish Gaelic and the, the indigenous language of people in in Galicia in in Spain? Um, there, there there is some linguistic overlap, right? Yeah, there absolutely is. So there's a couple of countries where like that where there's a bit of a they sprout out as a bit of a, as as a bit of an origin. I couldn't tell you to be sure. I do know. And my linguistics teacher back when I was doing commerce with German would would shoot me for it. But definitely, there's um, there's a linguistic connection. You have, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you have Scots Gaelic. The uh, the Welsh is a bit of a connection there, right. and uh, potentially also Galicia as well. Maybe one or two more. Um, yeah, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I'd have to, again, I'd have to get a slap in the hand from the uh, my linguistics oh, but, teacher. For but that just tells us that that your ancestors were a seafaring nation that exported beyond the island long before many yeah. other cultures. Were, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and one one of my friends here in the United States, he is of Irish descent. His um, um, I'm outing him here now, but that's perfectly fine. I think he, he'll give me permission. His last name is O'Shaughnessy, um, good old Irish name. And his Facebook profile, he made it a point to respell his last name in Irish. And I think it's mm. called O'Shaughnessy or something like that. I don't, yeah. I don't speak Irish. Um, but he he found out, uh, He I think he taught himself or he he studied Irish or I. How do you say Irish? Irish, or, yeah, Irish, yeah. yeah. So I, Irish or Gaelga, and if you want to translate it into exact language, but Irish is fine. Yeah, people get it. Yeah, you, you'll find American U.S. people of Irish descent who who take their Irish heritage so serious that they mm -hmm. they they take an interest in learning the the original language, right? So it, it's not just people in Ireland. It's uh, I guess the diaspora Irish do do similar things. Right? Hundred percent, and, and I, one of the things I found uh, I found uh, I've been really curious about is you find a lot of that Irish diaspora, they they really get very deep and very passionate about it and so proud. It's a wonderful thing. I and mean, they get really proud to go deep into their ancestry, deep into, let's say, the Irish culture, to understand their origins. And like you see, for example, a lot of, uh, for example, US politicians, that to a degree, they're playing it for the votes, but they are genuinely proud of the, the Irish uh, Irish history. And um, I have come across that. So when I was studying in UCD, I uh, definitely came across some Americans that were spending time over uh, University College Dublin, uh, spending the year, the couple of years, exactly doing exactly that i think it's a uh, mm. it's wonderful if i do believe i think it's Mara's mentioning as well that the number of irish speakers is actually increasing which is good it shows that there was a strategic focus by the government to try and boost the numbers of people speaking irish and hopefully that trend will continue nice mm. my, my my i have a, a friend right. who's a McGregan, um and he went to ireland he he discovered his kind of irish roots he's a McGuigan. he's got the mm. he's got the name um, although when he got, when he got there on the tour bus and they said, uh, "Is anybody got, you know is anybody Irish on the bus?" and he put his hand up thinking that that was the question, uh, you know, uh, "Do you have any Irish?" and he said, "No," and the guy and the guide said, "So so where are you from?" and he said, "Well, oh yeah, well, actually, I mean, I'm from Chicago." He said, "Well, you're not Irish." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the whole bus the whole bus just went quiet. Hilarious! 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 <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> but you know, what, one of the fascinating things I found is that Ireland is for such a small island, the the accents can change massively, like yeah. massively. I remember working for a summer um, on a on a I worked like four summers on a construction site at one stage, and one of the summers it was one of the first summers there. Um, this uh, this guy looks over at me and he goes, he says to me, "Run me away and get to Jenny." I said. I'm sorry, I, I have no idea. And this guy's coming from like less than 100 kilometers south of me. And I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. Could you please repeat that again? He said, may you go away and get the Jenny? I said, I, I kind of made out, will I go away and get the what? The, the Jenny? Is Jenny, Jenny? is Jenny a girl or is who, who is she? What you tell me more? What is a Jenny? And then I had to get the guy beside me to translate. And he said, a Jenny is a generator. I was going, ah, okay, I get it. But like this happened like a, a couple of times where people with really strong accents 
that in certain parts that uh, it takes even an Irish person just a minute or two just to rap. It's a bit like the whole Bavarian, you know, the real strong Bavarian accent. It takes a bit of getting used to it. But you wouldn't think that in such a small island. But you do have right. pockets right. where it can be tricky to fall. Well, I, I, I certainly came across that just in a couple of weeks in, in Dublin, just mm -hmm. catch taxi cabs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every driver had a different accent. They, yeah. they would tell you where they're from and all, you know, because uh, it was great. Yeah. So learning or getting familiar with the accent, would you, would it be okay as a non-Irish or somebody who is trying to fine tune your ear to watch some um, movies or TV productions? I'm, I'm, I'm right now. I'm thinking of something that my kids pulled up on Netflix a couple of months ago. We, they, we started watching Dairy Girls. So Dairy you know, Girls, yeah, that's a good one. It, it, is that authentic or is this just made for a U.S. audience? So the Dairy Girls, that one is based out of, if I'm not mistaken, um, so I've actually seen Dairy Girls a couple of episodes on it, and it is very authentic, and it's based out of, if I'm not mistaken, that's based out of, it's, about, it's based out of Derry, obviously. Derry's in Northern Ireland, but right. still, you can get a, you can still get a, a sense of uh, a little bit of a, a taste, because, I mean, there's a strong link between between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. There's a, I, I, that will depend on the certain traditions and whatnot, but there is a strong mm. link um uh, certainly over the last 20 years that's something that's increased so you can get a little bit of a taste there's a there are a couple of good ones there's um there's one called the snapper is a is a good one um and there's another one uh oh god they called the general which i saw uh yesterday that's on amazon prime i think for example the general it's about this right. irish gangster from uh, this guy was unbelievable he basically he robbed i think it was biggest jewelry heist of the i think it was the 90s he stole like literally millions oh, upon millions and it was I'm really about that. Yes. exactly yeah and on top of that then he stole like these like really intricate paintings worth literally like again tens of millions and just he was really really uh, real character let's say uh, and i'm not saying all irish people are gangsters they're not but again it was a bit of fun it gives you a sense of the different uh, the different accents funny enough a lot of let's say a lot of uh, non-irish actors trying to do the irish accents has uh, oh yeah great father ted great one absolutely absolutely great one. <laughs> yeah. we, we, gotta, we gotta explain that all right so father ted not everybody knows that i i wasn't a, i wasn't woke to father ted until recently and and brett actually made me aware of it the 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 Uh, the kind of indirect communication style that the Irish, some Irish people may display once in a while. And there's this, there's this clip of Father Ted, the, the priest, being offered tea by his host, and he yeah. declines it three times. Uh, and, it, and then the end, the host just pours the cup over his hand. Um, so is it how... how To talk to us because we're going to talk about this in our webinar, John. So we'll, we'll talk about our webinar soon. But uh, John and I will do a, a webinar on Irish culture next week. So you, you'll get you'll get the info in a minute here. But I, I want to make sure that we touch upon this. How indirect is Irish communication? So this is this is just a classic example. Um, you get somebody to your house, yeah, and you'll ask them. Say you say, Christian, come over here to the house. You're more than welcome. Come inside. Listen, Christian, will you have a cup of tea? And you'll say, No, no, I'm fine. And then you'll say, Oh, you will. You'll have a cup of tea, will you? And you'll say, No, no, I'm fine. I'm okay. And then you'll ask a third time. Now are you sure you'll have? You will. You will, of course, have a cup of tea. And on the third time, typically, the Irish person will say, Oh, well, okay, fair enough. I will. But as an Irish person, if you don't ask, you know, at least. Twice, if not three times, you'd be considered. Well, Jesus, I, wait, wait, that's the third time. I was going to say yes, <laughs> and this is fascinating because it wasn't until I, I mean, despite the fact I had traveled around the world, I'd lived in different countries at this stage, it wasn't actually until I went and lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years that I actually got to appreciate and understand Irish culture, because I mean, Dutch are, are very, very direct, and initially I was like, well, that's a bit rude sometimes that they can be so direct, but I began to appreciate after a while that. I actually like the clarity you got from that, from people being direct when they needed to be. But Irish people, I sometimes got frustrated that they can be very, very indirect. And things like that, for example, that's a small, funny example. But for example, when you're giving feedback, 
And if you ask somebody, for example, let's say I'm doing, giving a presentation to somebody in the Netherlands, and I ask them how was the presentation, the, somebody, the person in the Netherlands will go, yeah, that was crap, that's not going to work. Uh, uh, X, Y, and Z was, uh, was just uh, was really bad, it was really terrible, but that part D over here was okay, but the rest of it, no, it's not going to work, go back to the drawing board. Whereas for the same presentation, you give it to an Irish person, you ask them, well, tell me, what do you think? If the Irish person thought it was total rubbish, what they'll say to you is, well, you know what? Very interesting presentation. I like A, B, and C. That part D, we might have a think about. Um, but, you know, look, well done. Great effort. And I actually spoke to a Dutch banker about this when I was in Regina Chaley, a language school in the Netherlands. And he explained he did this to, for example, somebody from the UK. And basically, he went and projected, like, had this project worth a couple of million. He was going to hire about 10, 15 people. And he did it to his UK boss. And exactly that happened, where he's like, oh, uh, interesting presentation, like A, B, and C. Part D, I'm not so sure, uh, you know, but listen, well done. And he thought that was the, the green light. He went, invested the money, hired the people on, until about three weeks later, he got a really angry phone call from his, like, his British boss who said, what the hell were you doing? And so mm -hmm. that's something that could just as easily happen if it was uh, in Ireland, uh, I would say. Although, to be fair, it does depend on the individual personality, but Irish people typically are more indirect side. Yeah, th thank you for that. And, and for those of you, I already put the bear in. I'm doing it one more time. For those of you who want to dive a little deeper into the intricacies of Irish culture and how that shows up at work, um, join John and, and myself next week. Here's a link. Should be easy to follow. We'll, we'll post it in the comments as well. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Ireland for an hour. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a deep dive here, and and so F Father Ted is not the only one that we'll use as a teacher. <laughs> Brett, Brett I, I I sense a common brewing with you. What no, no great, okay. it's great. No, the, the fantastic. That, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I'm I, just every when we do work, sometimes we get these uh, projects in rashes. Just for the mm. moment, I'm actually working with some people that are going to Ireland. Um, some the three or four people, so I'm uh, excited to dive back into it because I've got, you know, that, that that's where I got Father Ted from was using a friend of mine in Ireland uh, that that, and he had the he, he had the people that we were working with in complete stitches the way he was describing Father Ted and they said and they went and they watched watched it and they came back and they said it's exactly right that, no 100%, 100%. and one of the one of the things which is really fascinating like these days is in a post brexit world you, you see Irish, let's say, uh, Irish, uh, the, the, let's say the diplomatic community of Ireland tend to have a lot more influence compared to before a couple of years ago. So, for example, uh, Pascal Dunne, who is the chair of the Eurogroup, which is like the Euro, Eurozone finance ministers. You've got uh, Ireland's on the Security Council now, for example. You've got very senior Irish people in the civil service of, of Europe in, uh, in general. Uh, you've got the Trade Commissioner for Europe is Phil Hogan. He's Irish, for example. So you've got, uh, you know, they've got a bunch of these around the the world so for whatever reason is when it comes to let's say on global diplomacy ireland is definitely um punching way above its weight uh, in more ways uh, in more ways than one so maybe that's something to think about and maybe to explore next week as well uh christian who mm -hmm. knows we're looking forward to yes. it and 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 th this is i think also highlighted by the comment that tamara is making here that um uh, non-irish are often confused by the irish uh, indirectness and 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 high level and high skill level in diplomacy because the expectation is that Irish are, um, well, at least in in North America, the expectation of the Irish is that they are the fighting Irish, the yeah, yeah, yeah. the the belligerent, the cantankerous, the um, confrontational types, mm. and that stereotype doesn't look to reality. Where, where do you think that comes from? Yeah, it's it's a it's a great one. And it's one of the things where Irish people, it's it's fascinating. So if they don't know you, or if it's in, a, let's say, a work setting, very, very indirect, uh, extremely indirect. But if you're, let's say, a good friend, ferociously direct, like you get the knees ripped off you with the slagging, people having fun and, and just having a bit of banter, let's say. Um, well, where it comes like from with me. I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it, it's it's one of the things where there must be yeah I mean clearly I mean people from these islands just tend to be more in more uh, more more indirect and it's fascinating how I can't quite put a finger in it because if you, on the one hand is it related to religious origins or what I don't know because for example Dutch more of a Protestant background and more direct or whatnot whereas for example Belgium 
they're more catholic and very indirect but it's much more complicated than that there's so many mm. different reasons for it but all i can say is pretty much consistently around these islands whether someone's from scotland wales or england or, or ireland or republic of ireland and uh, northern ireland they just tend to be more uh, indirect and it's one thing i'll be honest but I, I find it fascinating when i was working my old corporate career in crh it's ireland's biggest company it was in the european division in the netherlands and i was kind of a bit of the linking pin between let's say the the dutch uh, let's say headquarters look after europe and the let's say the uh, head office based in dublin and it definitely that indirectness let's say the directness versus the dutch and the indirectness versus the irish i could really see how it really can cause a lot of miscommunication and it was actually there we started doing a lot of intercultural courses which really really helped but it's definitely something that you know i, I would say you know, when I, when I talk about uh, one of the first things I start with when it comes to intercultural training is the direct versus versus indirect uh, element and being aware of it. Because if you can be at least be on top of that, it's a great starting point. Because if you if you're not, it can cause uh, you know a war and peace. Uh, if uh, if you're not, but as for the origin of it, it's a very tricky one. I couldn't tell you exactly where that communication style comes from. I mean, even turning it around, uh, let's say Christian or Beth. I mean, I know the the Aussies tend to be more direct. I would say, and uh, in let's say in, in Germany, for example, uh, Christian, they're uh, they're more direct as well. Uh, how, where would where does it all come from? I guess this direct versus indirect. Um, well, I, I I always suggest to people for Australians um, because you know I'm living in the US. I'm now mm. used to the direct and low context, mm. whereas Aussies are direct but high context. And mm. I and, and the way I say that is that we use humour and sarcasm as a context. Mm. Mm -hmm. to uh, to not so much directly confront somebody but to bring a sense of lightheartedness into a conversation mm -hmm. and to do that sometimes we come off as kind of very acerbic and uh, and you know I tell, do tell people if people are calling you names and that kind of thing in Australia that means you they really like you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's hard to understand for people but uh, that I found that and before we went live today I mentioned to John I, that it, it that my time in Ireland was um, interesting to to really be aware of how comfortable I felt in Ireland mm. because there was that sense of you know you people go kind of made a bit of fun at you they 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 mm. poked you they pricked your balloon a little bit to see how much you could take but it, it, it it's for, kind of a mateness a mateness kind of like you say in Australia that being a mate and having a bit right. of fun with it. yeah. yeah yeah so it was just and it happened to me in the pub the very first night I the, the in, in Ireland. <laughs> when I walked into a pub and uh, there was a guy wandering around handing out sheets for a bit of a trivia night. Mm. And, uh, and, and he wa and I was just alone, bellied up to the bar, you know, enjoying a nice frothy Guinness. Mm. And he said, uh, would, uh, would you like a sheet? And I said, yeah, oh yeah, I'll play mate. No worries at all. And he said, oh, you're Australian, are you? And I went, yeah. And he immediately announced it to the whole bar. <laughs> and, and I got jeers and, and. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And it's Love like, it. Oh, oh, nice. Abus that's abusing nice. the parole foreigners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, you know. But I didn't, I, I wasn't offended for, by it. No, I know. It was a bit of fun. That, yeah. that felt so much like home, it wasn't funny. Yeah, it was great. While you were talking about this, I, I had an idea. Maybe, maybe, maybe some scholar who's watching this will, will set us straight. So, my, my theory on where that uh, that stereotype of the aggressive or, or fighting Irish comes from at least in north america is the immigration story of the irish because the irish uh, immigration wave came to north america when there had already been other immigrants from other parts of the world and especially in in the catholic in the catholic areas where the irish settled there had all already been um italians there had been uh, other other or polish mm -hmm. there had been other catholics already but the catholics find each other and they had to carve out their niches i guess and that's when when fighting amongst each other began um gangs of new york would be a great movie to illustrate mm. that a scorsese mm. picture that i can I, I mean i love scorsese so watch that movie regardless mm. and then if you look at at the i lived in that region for long enough to to speak with a little bit of confidence about it is the appalachian region which was settled predominantly by scotch Irish settlers who came mm. with their own religious um, foundation, lots of Presbyterians, a lot of um, uh, Protestants who who rose up against the, the 
Catholic Church, whether it was in Ireland or in in Great Britain against the the, the Anglican Church. So they were the the people on the islands in Europe were happy to see them go and and they had they they brought their clan culture with them right there's this you you belong to this bubble of the extended family of the clan of you of the in group and if my neighbors are the O'Reillys and we're the O'Shaughnessys and you're the McDougals then we may not get along with each other and if you kill my cow then I punch your n nephew's teeth out well I mean there was an eye for an eye and a and, and so forth. So there was this, I think that there's this very territorial um, in-group thinking culture that these immigrants brought with them helped shape that image of the Irish who can go in a fight easily, of whether that's true or not. Well, I think more in more recent years, you've always going to have bad behavior amongst a minority, for example, of people who are not, you know, drinking too much, for example, in the bars or whatnot and getting into fights or, or whatnot. But I think, thankfully, it's more in the, the minority in, the, in most cases. But um, I think one of the things to, uh, to, to look at is if you look at it as well, in the last 20 years, Ireland has changed so much in the last 20, 30 years, ever since the Celtic Tiger of the 90s, this big kind of an economic miracle that kicked off then. Um, you've seen an influx of a lot more people from different nationalities. And it's funny, if that's had a big impact on Irish culture, uh, there's still a lot more work to be done there in terms of integration, uh, in terms of stamping out racism in uh, for the people for the small minority, for example. But in general, it's been very, very positive for Ireland. It's opened up Ireland in so many different ways. So, for example, so the last Taoiseach we had, the last Prime Minister, was uh, Leo Varadkar, and he was uh, he was a gay, uh, half Indian, half Irish uh, Prime Minister. And a great, uh, great one. Uh, did a lot of positive things with that as well. But that kind of mm. signified, for example, the the journey that Ireland has gone from being, for example, very reliant on the, let's say, Catholic Church, and very inward looking, to being much more outward looking and being very much more progressive and, and much more liberal and much more, you know, less conservative in their outlook and, and much more right. multicultural. So that's left a big imprint. And I think also the fact that there's been so many returning immigrants as well, Irish people who went abroad and came back as well, that's had a big impact on the shape of the country as well. Nice. Yeah. Well, what, what, what's the Irish word for prime minister? You, you said it, Taoiseach? T Taoiseach, yeah. T-shirt. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's what they call him on the media in Ireland and where in abroad he's referred to as the prime minister. Exactly. So they'll say the Taoiseach or Taoiseach or, Taoiseach or and brackets then prime minister. It's the equivalent of, uh, of, of prime minister, let's say. Yeah. That's so, that's a Gaelic uh, word, or that's a... uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's uh, exactly a Gaelic word. It's an Irish uh, Irish for uh, uh, for prime minister. Yeah. I see. We never stop learning. This is what this program yeah. is about. Learn, people. <laughs> Get to know the world. Lovely, John. It was yeah. awesome having you on. I could do this all afternoon. Thanks. Guys, it was a real pleasure. Really enjoyed it, Brett and Christian. Thanks so much for having me on. Really, really enjoyed it. And a shout out to Tamara as well for of Theatre Ireland for all the the, uh, the uh, questions and remarks as well. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you, and we'll see you next week on you Doing next week. Business with Ireland. So you get more of us. So if you, I'm sure you can't get enough of us, especially this dude. <laughs> so hey, next week, sign up. Looking forward to it, guys. We'll see you. All right. Bye. See you. Bye.